Hi, hello, hi. So today I want to talk about kind of a big topic. Today I want to talk to you all about intersectionality. The reason why is because it's a term that I see used a lot within the trans community, and I think it's important to understand where it came from, what it means, all that good stuff. So let's jump right into it. So the term intersectionality was coined by the black feminist scholar Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989, who is an American civil rights activist, a leading scholar on critical race theory, and a full-time law professor specializing in race and gender issues. So in this video, I'm going to be referring to her work, given that she's the one who literally created this term. And her work focuses mainly on black women. The term itself, intersectionality, was created for black women to highlight the dynamics at play when it came to feminism and race, and the fact that at the time, a lot of feminists were not taking into consideration the role that race plays in gender inequality. So given that I'm basing this video off of um, Kimberly Crenshaw's research, that means I'll be basing a lot of my examples and my explanations off of black women. I just wanted to make that clear because I do not want to speak over others. I do not want to speak over the experiences of black women. I just want to stay true to her research and I don't want to deviate away from her main points. So. A little explanation there. So the term intersectionality is actually more than just a term. It was initially created as an analytical framework that attempts to identify how interlocking systems of power impact those who are most marginalized in society. An analytic framework is a detailed sketch or outline of a social phenomenon. Like to put it simply, it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but to put it simply, think of it as like literally a picture frame. A picture frame frames a picture. An analytic framework frames a social concept or a social phenomenon. It is an outline. It outlines that issue. It creates a structure or a way of analyzing or approaching the situation. Pretty much, kind of. I hope I'm explaining that well. But just so you understand what I mean by analytic framework, it's literally just a structure for the concept itself. What does it mean to be existing at an intersection? What, what does an intersection even mean? Uh, when it comes to social hierarchy and identities. Prior to Professor Crenshaw's research, these two issues were kind of seen as separate. So racial oppression was its own thing, and gender inequality was its own thing. Basically, women's rights movements were for all women. It's a win for everyone. And same with racial movements. It's a win for everyone. But it didn't really take into account those who are landing between the two. So during first wave feminism, largely the focus was on issues that pertained to white women, and they didn't focus on racial inequality inequality and the role that racial inequality plays on the fate of black women. And similarly for racial movements, there wasn't much about how women are uniquely affected by racism. So I know that's a lot of words and very confusing, so I'm going to go ahead and use an example, and I think that that might clarify things. This is an example from Kimberly Crenshaw's research. This example will explain intersectionality as a framework a little better, and what I mean when I say that it is more than just a term. So Kimberly Crenshaw said that the intersectionality framework was intended to be used as a tool. What is meant by this is it's a tool to be used legally in court. Um, one of the cases that she referred to was black women taking an employer to court for discrimination for not hiring black women. However, their case didn't stand because the employer hires black men and the employer hires women. However, the women are not black and the black people are not women. They hire black men and they hire white women. So black women are still being discriminated against by this employer. But again, it didn't stand up in court because for the court, it was enough that this employer hires black men and hires white women. It doesn't matter that they don't hire black women because are there black people there? Yes. Are there women there? Yes. Well, it's done. But these women, these black women who fall within this intersection, they're, they're left falling between the cracks of inequality. There were frameworks in place for women in the workplace and there were frameworks in place um, for black people in the workplace, but it was at the intersection that the policies converged and those left within that intersection fell between those cracks. They were being discriminated against in a way that is unique to black women. Being part of that intersection requires more protection. However, the court saw it as unfair. It was seen as an unfair advantage by the court for these black women to combine these two legal courses of action in order to make an articulable claim. Because black women were the only ones who needed this, 
because they were the only ones who needed to combine these policies and needed to combine these two legal courses of action, it was seen as preferential treatment to give it to them. So now with this case, how does intersectionality come into play as a framework and how is the intersectionality framework used as a tool? So Professor Crenshaw said, given that the judges couldn't quite get how combining these policies wouldn't be preferential treatments, given the frameworks that they currently had, Professor Crenshaw said, we need another framework. So she created the intersectional framework and as she puts it, it was a word picture, a way for them to redirect their thinking and see this situation and other similar situations for what they were, which was simply converging patterns of subordination. This framework was a structure aimed at giving that space, giving that protection to those who are existing in a space between the two existing policies, between the existing frameworks, and giving the courts a way to see where they're coming from and push for them to combine the two policies or to combine more than one course of legal action and to take into account the complexities of existing within more than one intersection, recognizing that not all the policies in place cover the existence of every person and the type of oppression that they experience. So that's basically kind of in a nutshell it for how the intersectional framework works as a tool, but a couple of things worth noting about intersectionality, some things that Kimberly Crenshaw has said that I really do want to bring up because as you probably know, intersectionality is used as more than just a framework, as more than just in court, it's used as a term oftentimes, and there's there are a couple things about that. So firstly, intersectionality is not strictly about identity. It's about social power and oppression. Not all identities will be part of an intersection. So for example, white women saying that they're intersectional because they are Christian and not everyone likes Christians, um, that's not it. That's not, uh, that's, that is appropriating a term that was not meant for you. Um, there's a difference between being disliked and being oppressed. You're not oppressed for being Christian. It's not, oppression doesn't work that way. Oppression is complex and systemic. It's not about any one specific person disliking you. It is about a societal disadvantage and a power that is held over others. So intersectionality refers to those who are oppressed in more than one way. So those existing within more than one marginalized group of people. So in Kimberly Crenshaw's research, she focused primarily on black women and how existing within that intersection of racial discrimination and gender inequality impact the lives of black women and those particular cases she looked at. I think that when discussing intersectionality, it's important to know that. It's important to know where this term came from, why it was created, who created it, what purpose has it served, the historical context behind the term. I don't know if you follow the podcast Cheeky Natives, but it's a podcast by James Lord and Dr. Alma Nelisha. On their podcast, they were interviewing Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, and they said something really important that I wanted to repeat, which is the work of black women is often stolen, taken without citation, and then used incorrectly or out of context, used in whatever way it suits the person who is appropriating the work. And Kimberly Crenshaw referred to this in a really interesting way. She called it gentrifying intersectionality. Basically taking something and saying, oh, this is nice, we love this, we're just gonna move, like, you could, you could leave, this is ours now, which is really similar to the way that gentrification of neighborhoods works, but this is kind of like, I guess, a um, an academic gentrification. I think it's important to talk about this as an activist because, again, I see this term used a lot within the trans community, and the history behind the term is important. When we're using work, when we're using terms, I think it's important, especially if you are a white activist like me, ask yourself, where did this term come from? Who created it? What does it mean? Who is it created for? If you don't know the answers to those questions, even if you're not doing it maliciously, even if you don't mean it, you could potentially be speaking over people or appropriating work that is not your own or misusing work for something that it was not intended to be used for. So I want to just start talking about some of these terms, I guess. I think it's important to know and I want to just encourage others to be mindful. It is quite intimidating to be talking about such a legendary scholar like Kimberly Crenshaw, um, but I'm doing my best and I hope that this was at least somewhat easy to follow. Sorry if this was a really information heavy video. I put a lot of research into this. I'm going to be putting my sources in the description of this video. And uh, that's it. If you have any questions or things you'd like to contribute to this discussion, please feel free. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day and a great week and you take care of yourselves. All right, thanks, bye.